Well, welcome to Fellowship Church Online. We're so glad that you decided to join us. Right now, we're in our Stories of Jesus sermon series. And in this series, we're playing clips from The Chosen. And due to copyright law, we won't be including those portions in the sermon. In place of these clips, there'll be instructions on where to go and how to watch them. We encourage you to watch along with us and even join us in person. Now let's watch the message together. All right. Well, good morning, Fellowship Church. How's everyone doing? Well, obviously, I'm not Pastor Sean, <laughs> but my name is Aaron Demai, and I serve as creative director here at this amazing church. So um, it's a privilege and honor to be here with you guys today and just share the word. Uh, so today, we're actually in our uh, third week of, I'm sorry, yeah, third week of our series titled um, Stories of Jesus. And what we're doing is we're taking a deep dive into scripture. And then from there, we then use clips of the TV series, The Chosen, to then reinforce that specific message. How many of you guys have been enjoying the series so far? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm excited because today uh, we get to talk a little bit about somebody who I really resonate with, and that's Peter. So just a quick backstory, while you watch this clip, you're going to notice that Peter is referred to as Simon. Now, Simon, before his transformation, I'm sorry, Peter, before his transformation, was named Simon. Once that, after that transformation, Jesus then named him Peter. The interesting thing with this, I think sometimes we allow ourselves to be uh, named or identified as something else that maybe a family member, culture, or the world has given us. But when, but when we are then transformed, Jesus calls us and gives us a new name. So what we want to do is, or what I want to do is I want us to lean in into what Jesus is showing us today and what, what uh, the scripture is going to show us today. So let's, take a, let's go ahead and look at, um, if you're taking notes, the scripture here is Matthew 14, 22 to 33. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking in the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat, this is my favorite part, worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. See, what this clip does, uh, what this uh, scripture right here says, it's, it captures a moment. And sometimes that's what it takes for a transformation for us to happen is one moment. It can be a a moment in worship. It can be a moment at a a youth camp. It can be a moment in prayer. But it's one moment where God can take that and start that transformation. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about faith. Not just faith as I have faith or an action of faith, but we're going to talk about faith more to look at it through the lens of a process. There's a process through faith. And what you'll notice in the scripture, when, when God does something, there's a transformation, there's always steps to something. If you pay attention to how the scripture lays it out and how God uh, will perform a miracle, there's always some kind of process. Either somebody has to lean in, there's a step of faith, there's a stepping out, there's a keeping your eyes on Jesus, whatever that looks like, there's a process to it. So before we get into that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what the scripture says, and this isn't on your notes, but it's, it's the definition of what faith is, and it's found in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, God is doing something, no matter if you see it or not. You may not even feel it in the beginning, but God's waiting for you to lean in. 
Because once you lean in, God can slowly walk you through that process. And when you start walking through that process, keeping your, your eyes and fix on who Jesus is, God can do amazing things in your life. So that person that is dealing with some, some issues and needs some healing, God can take care of that. That relative who, who's far from God and, and doesn't even want to come to church, God can save them. God can do amazing things when you allow the process to work itself out, but it starts with the action of faith. See, we have so much faith in other things, but when it comes to who Jesus is, we tend to panic. So I want to title this message, What is Faith? Simple sentence, what is faith? Let's watch this clip from The Chosen. There's a moment, a moment, where Peter took his eyes off Jesus. Just like there, it takes a moment to lean in to go where Jesus is leading us, could take a moment to take us out of that. All it took was a moment to look at what was happening that distracted where God was trying to take him. We all have different moments of transformation. For Peter, it was this process. He had to step out, he had to step in, and he had to trust. He had to step out, step in, and trust who Jesus was at that moment. Last year, I had this personal transformation moment myself. And it was in the summer last year in Southern California. Now, I'm not proud of what I'm about to tell you. Okay, check this out. So last summer, like I said, we were hanging out with the family. We were having a barbecue, and we were grilling some food. We had music playing. The whole family was there. We're all having a great time, just enjoying the sun in the summer, on vacation with the family. All the kids are in the pool. Family's in the pool. I'm in the pool. But the difference is I'm in the pool on this big inflatable donut. Okay, So I'm laying down on this donut, just enjoying myself, working on my tan, and just hanging out where the kids are playing. I'm in there for maybe a good 30, 45 minutes. And it was at that point, my 10-year-old daughter, Layla, who had just finished her swim classes and is now a level four swimmer, so shout out to her, asked me the scariest question I had heard to that point. And she said, Dad, do you want me to teach you how to swim? And I told you I wasn't proud of this moment, right? So she asked me to, Dad, do you want to learn how to swim? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Let's do it. So I stepped out, stepped in, and then started to, to uh, take her, her advice on how to do this. As I'm in the pool, my feet are touching the bottom of the pool. I'm waving my hands, holding, holding my breath, all the things that she's teaching me how to do. Keep in mind, she's 10 years old, okay? So she's teaching me how to do all these things, and then... She, she starts floating and says, look, Dad, you, all you have to do is this, and you start floating. I'm trying it, and it's not working for me. I'm getting water in my nose. It's a very uncomfortable moment for me. I start feeling embarrassed. At that moment, I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. And I got really uncomfortable whenever I would pick my feet up off of the floor of, uh, of the pool because at that moment, I felt uncomfortable. See, she said something interesting to me. She said, Dad, if you want to swim, you can't keep your feet at the bottom. See, I don't know if she realizes, but she said something very profound that I think relates to this specific moment. And she said, you can't, if you want to stay in the place of comfort, you're not going to be able to do the thing that God is calling you out to do. You can't be comfortable and follow Christ at the same time. Does, doesn't work. That's where the transformation happens. That's the beauty of the gospel, is knowing that there's transformation on the other side. In order to do that, you have to step out, step in, and trust who God says he is. See, this is what Peter had to understand. When Jesus called him out, he had to understand that process because faith always begins where comfort ends. See, Joshua 1.9 says this, it says, I have not commanded, ha, have I not commanded you? Be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. 
See, to me, this is what following Jesus looks like. You find yourself drowning in, in, in trials and uh, no hope of getting out. And then the Lord reaches out, pulls you in, and gives you a hug, just like the clip that we just saw. There are things that God is calling us into. He could be calling you to take growth track, tell your neighbor about sharing your faith with your neighbor, telling others about the amazing things that God is doing in your life. God is calling you into something. The thing is, are you listening and are you going to keep your eyes on him while you're doing it? I love this quote from the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and it says this, when a man can't find a deep sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasure. See, three things that Peter did in that moment, he stepped out, stepped in, and he put his eyes on Jesus. So if you're taking notes, your first point is going to be this, God is calling us to step out. God is calling us to step out. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not some, all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. See, the building of your faith always takes place in these moments because God's call will often come with a challenge. So I want to ask you, what areas in your life is God calling you to step out in faith today? Because after Peter stepped out, he then stepped into the water. So if you pay attention to this, this portion, it's, think of it as something that, uh, as, as symbolism would show you, right? Because if the boat is our comfort zone, the water represents the unknown. The challenges of the uncertain, uncertain moments of our life. Walking on water is an entirely different part of faith. This is what you call sustained faith. There's a difference between I have faith versus living a faith-filled life. It's two different things. You can say, I have faith in this moment, or I have faith in who Jesus is. I have faith for life. There's a difference. And I'm going to break down what sustained faith looks like. It's not just the act of stepping out. It's about sustaining focus and faith in who he is. See, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of of your changing moods. It's like saying I'm going to get a gym membership and I'm going to get fit and then waking up the next day and saying like, oh, the, the bed's got me. I can't get out this time. It's the same thing. You can't expect these results that you're not putting the work in for, right? You can't get mad at the miracles that God is not performing where you're not living out that faith-filled life that he's calling you to live out. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorned in its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, even in the storm, we must step into the calling. So point number two, if you're taking notes, is this, the reality of the storm. The reality of the storm. Isaiah 43, 2 says this, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. See, the presence of a storm does not mean it's the absence of God. Because even in fear, you have to remember that Jesus is still near. Faith does not eliminate fear, it overcomes it. So you may be fearful as God is calling you into something, and as you're walking through it, the point is to still understand that he's on the other side. There's a transformation occurring. See, culture tells us that, that we have to you know, wake up at 5 a.m., take three cold plunges, uh, take 10 protein shakes, and open two LLCs by noon, and if we don't do that, we're a failure. See, but I'm here to tell you when, when you fix your eyes on who Jesus is, everything else just, just falls into place, right? Not saying that there's anything wrong with those things, but when you make those things your idol and you put those things ahead of who Jesus is calling you to be, it's, it's, a, it's taking you off your path and purpose. See, the rejection of God's way will always lead to more restlessness, 
Recently, I read an article in Wired Magazine, and it said this. The two most searched phrases in Google this last year when typing in the words, will I, were this. Will I always be depressed? Will I always be sad? See, what this is telling us is trying to find peace through our own strength and leading to a greater disconnect from God is always going to lead to a hopeless and restless life. See, when we look at culture and what, we, what culture is telling us is true rest, we're not going to be able to sleep at night. We're still going to feel restless. You can do all these things. For a moment, you might feel good, but after that moment, you're going to feel way worse than you did in the beginning of that. Some of you, I get it. You may feel like you're drowning. You can't sleep at night. You may feel like you're struggling and you don't know what to do. You're drowning. You're drowning. You're drowning. I get it. Like, you don't know. Like, Aaron, you don't know what I'm going through. You're drowning. You can't sleep at night. You're restless. You're frustrated. Depression's getting the best of you. But see, the thing is, when we try to find rest and and what the world defines as rest, we have to understand there's a lifesaver, and that lifesaver is Jesus. And when we put on the vest of faith, he's going to get us through these things, right? Because that's what he does. Our rest is understanding who he is. It's not what the world defines as rest. See, Mark 4, 39 to 40 says this. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Some of us, I feel, really need to let that resonate with us today. Because when we take our eyes off who Jesus is, we start to sink. And the more we take our eyes off Jesus and we start putting our eyes on ourselves, thinking, I'm going to get myself out of this, we sink even deeper and deeper. And then before you know, you look around, you think, how did I get here? And like I said earlier, all it does is take a moment. It takes a moment of a bad decision. It takes a moment of of putting your faith in your own understanding and what you can do. See, rest and understanding and finding purpose and and fulfillment in life does not come from what angle the moon is facing and what stars are are going this way and what yoga pose you're in at 10 p.m. eating white rice over a a blue blanket. That's not where you find rest. True rest is understanding who God is and putting your eyes on him, fixing your eyes on Jesus. See, so what you focus on will determine whether you sink or stand. The question is, are you going to fix your eyes on who he is? Because when you take your eyes off Jesus, you lose sight of who he is. See, a few years ago, our son Max, uh, he's three years old now. So yeah, this was a few years ago. He was only a few months old. He was still a newborn baby. And for those dads out there or any parent, like you know the feeling, you can't wait to get home to see your newborn baby especially in the afternoon because he's getting ready to take his afternoon nap. I remember getting home from work one day. And as I, as I walked into the house, I remember seeing my mother-in-law, my wife, and uh, our daughter sitting there, and they just looked really, like, bummed out. And I remember asking him, like, what, what's going on? And our son, Max, at the time was just, just crying. And you know when a baby starts crying with uh, that, like, raspy, that raspy cry because they've been crying for so long, I remember thinking to myself, like, is he okay? Like, what's going on? Did you, did you nurse him? Did you, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you put this blanket on him? Did you uh, uh, play his white noise? Did you uh, hold him? Like, and he was not falling asleep. They said, he hasn't slept in hours. He was restless. And I remember that specific moment, picking up Max, and I said, let me take him for a walk, see what happens. And, you know, giving me that look of like, yeah, right, what are you going to do, right? I remember taking him, wrapping his legs around me, his little body and holding his little head, and going for a walk up and down our neighborhood. And I, re- I remember, um, like it was yesterday, there was a specific moment, because that's all it took. I remember looking down on him. His eyes were just swollen. I remember he gently closed his eyes. You know, taking that deep breath, like, you know, when kids, you know, he's out, right? And then you start thinking, like, yeah, I got him. And I remember walking back to the house. As a dad, I put my hands up and I dropped, I didn't drop, I'm just joking. But um, put my hands up and I started doing a victory lap around the house because I'm like dad of the year at this moment, right? And everybody's like, yeah, Aaron got him to sleep finally. And I remember my daughter specifically saying this and she said, dad, how did you get Max to fall asleep? And this is what I told her. I said, come on, Layla, he knows who his daddy is. I 
think some of us forget who our Father is. And when we do that, we're restless, we're, 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 we get knocked left and right from what the world is doing, what culture is telling us. And any little thing that anyone is telling us, we're believing that. When that's not where our identity is found, it's found in who he is, and when our eyes are kept on who he is in our life. That's where transformation happens, and that's the beauty of the gospel. Because when you're able to do that, you'll find yourself doing crazy things that you would never expect to happen. Like, oh my gosh, did you get that, that report? I'm healed. Guess what? I'm out of debt. Guess what? We're about to get a divorce, and now we're back together. I was going to take my life last week, but guess what? I'm alive well, and I'm celebrating. So I'm here to tell you right now, when you keep your eyes on who he is, he will do amazing things. But it takes one moment, and that's stepping in. When you step in, step out, and keep your eyes on who he is, God will do amazing things. And I get it, some of you may feel tired and restless, but I'm here to encourage you today that he's got you. He's got you. If you wanna get more involved, join the Next Girl Track class by clicking the link description below. We also love to serve our local community, nationally and globally, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. If you would like to support our ministry, on the bottom of the screen are some ways you can give. But we wanna say thank you for your generosity. If you guys want to watch last week's message or a message from a previous week, click on one of the videos on the screen and we'll see you guys there.